Thank you. Uh, it's really an honor to be included among this really amazing collection of speakers you've brought together. It's, it's really been a who's who of, of healthcare, and, and it makes me feel like I'm, I'm the who's that of tonight's panel. <laughs> but um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> so a little bit about myself. Back in high school, I, I, I read this book. Thank you. Uh, the book was called uh, Microbe Hunters. It was written in 1926, and uh, it was a collection of stories about the heroes of microbiology and um, about the individuals who really changed the course of human history when they found out that uh, the cause of many of mankind's greatest afflictions were, in fact, microscopic organisms. And I remember being fascinated at how these single-celled organisms and, and tiny viruses could possibly bring down human beings and large animals that were much more complex and sophisticated. And then I went off to medical school, and there I learned about cancers and how they, too, often started with mutations that would lead to unchecked growth, starting with just a single cell. And among the many things I learned on my way to becoming a doctor, I, probably the most impactful thing was uh, this avid appreciation that uh, you know, while the, the human body is an extraordinary machine, it really does take just uh, a, a tiny wrench or a loose screw to bring the whole thing come, to come crashing down. And when I went off to business school a few years later, I learned that the same fate actually awaits successful businesses, that throughout business history, tiny upstart companies will bring down much larger competitors and in the process transform entire industries. And oftentimes, it seemed not to matter whatever the large companies would try to do to defend themselves. The small guys would just grow and grow and grow until eventually they became the new leaders of the industry. And this, this cycle of the rise and fall of businesses would repeat itself over and over again. And big businesses that were seemingly healthy in one year would all of a sudden find themselves swept away uh, by little companies who had found a different way to make a product that more people wanted and more could afford. Now, none of this would be very surprising, except for the fact that it happened with, with such ease and such regularity that there was even a predictable pattern to it. And it was this pattern that Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen called disruptive innovation. And I believe that if we apply these ideas to healthcare, we can also figure out how to make healthcare affordable, too. Now, what is disruptive innovation? Well, in a nutshell, it's taking an industry that has traditionally relied on costly expertise and then gradually replacing that expertise with a simplifying technology so you don't need the experts anymore. Put a different way, it's using technology to enable people to do more for themselves things that they used to have to pay others to do for them. So, for example, today, when we, when we book travel, uh, more often we're doing this on our own or using low-cost booking engines online rather than going to a travel agent. And yes, if you have a complex itinerary, you'll probably go to a travel agent still and have that expert intervene on your behalf. But for the simplest trips, those, uh, that old business model has largely been disrupted. And when it comes to preparing taxes and accounting, more of us are turning to software programs that allow us to do these things for ourselves rather than having to turn to a financial professional. And once again, if you have complicated finances, you'll probably hire a professional accountant. But for the simple stuff, once again, that old business model is largely obsolete. And we're seeing, seeing the same thing happen in, in real estate, in banking, investing, publishing, in uh, real estate and retail. There are so many tools out there now that can help you do what only the professionals used to be able to do, or which can help low-cost low service providers do what only high-cost service providers used to be able to do. Now, so that's disruptive innovation. It, it basically makes products and services more affordable to more people who previously couldn't buy those products or services because they were too expensive or too complex. And yet, if it's such a powerful force in all these other service industries, why haven't we seen more of it in healthcare? And that, to answer that question, it really requires us to understand what's wrong with healthcare in the first place. Now, there are a lot of theories out there. People think that you know, it's because there's too much new technology that costs too much and we just use too much of it. Uh, it's the cost of new drugs, it's because doctors and hospitals make too much money, it's because private insurance adds unnecessary administrative overhead, and there's a few that very vocal people that think it's because there's too many lawyers, and honestly, some, some, some of these no matter what industry you're talking about. But none of these reasons ever felt right or complete to me, because there were just so many things wrong with healthcare, and one fix here and another fix there couldn't possibly fix the real problem, right? 
I mean, there had to be something deeper and more systemic going on, and it just felt like we were misdiagnosing what was actually happening. And really, that's a very common trap that we face in healthcare because it's so easy to suddenly just treat the symptoms and forget to treat the underlying di diagnosis. But when we do that, we start to implement solutions that don't work. It's sort of like treating a fever with Tylenol but forgetting to address the infection that's causing the fever in the first place. And so it, it's so tempting to do that sort of thing because it is easy to observe uh, symptoms, but it's much harder to dig deep and find the root cause. And so when it comes to healthcare reform, it's easy to see where the money flows. We see it going to new drugs and new technologies, into hospital bills and doctor salaries, and we think if we can just turn down or turn off those spigots, then everything would be resolved. But of course, we know it's not that simple. And I'm here to talk about what I think is the root cause of the problems of healthcare, about why it is that disruptive innovation hasn't happened to a larger degree in healthcare, and why it is that technologies in other industries seem to make things more affordable, yet in healthcare, things only seem to get more expensive. And it has to do with something that uh, I call malpractice, but it's not the malpractice that we're used to hearing about, it's business model malpractice. Because for all that we spend in this country on the breakthrough technologies that we have, on the advanced hospitals and, and the greatest doctors in the world, very little of that actually drives disruptive innovation. Because if you think about it, it doesn't really make us less dependent on medical expertise. It's making us more dependent on the costly medical experts out there. And it's our implementation of fantastic 21st century technologies into old business models and payment systems that are in fact rooted in the 19th and early 20th centuries that's really the, the cause of our, our problems in healthcare. Again, it's this idea that uh, the, the science of business has just not kept up with the science of medicine. And that's why healthcare seems to become less and less affordable, even though we have new technologies coming down the pipeline each and every day. There's a great analogy I recently heard for this predicament that we face in healthcare do with this idea that the, the top speed of passenger trains in the United States is still very much the same as it was a century ago. And it has nothing to do with the fact that we don't know how to build faster trains. We do. But it's the fact that we run them on railroad tracks that were built in the 19th century. And so you can have Acela's, uh, the Acela train, which has a maximum speed of 150 miles per hour, but it still runs at an average of 61 miles per hour between Boston and New York. And similarly in healthcare, we just have these constraints around our technologies that prevent them from being as disruptive as they could be. So how do we get here? What exactly is wrong with our business models? Well, I, I think it boils down to this common assumption that we all hold, um, that when it comes to healthcare, complexity is desirable. If I can explain that, it's, we, we've all supported this notion that the ideal healthcare delivery system is the large academic medical center. And uh, an illustration of that is, if you were to talk to an expectant mother where she'd like to give birth, there's almost a built-in maternal reflex to want to go to the big university hospital. But the ideal place, the ideal environment for that delivery, pres presuming it's normal, is that uh, it's going to be at her local community hospital or a birthing center that can focus on doing routine deliveries over and over again. It's not the big university hospital that has to contend with the complicated delivery down the hall or the, the room full of ICU patients downstairs or the, the level one trauma patient that's landing on the helicopter pad on the roof. And yet, we, ha we have this expectation that we need to get all our healthcare in one place. And it's caused us to constantly expand the scope of activities that our medical centers are asked to offer. When coronary angioplasties became commonplace, we built cath labs in hospitals so they could be next to cardiac surgery departments. We built dialysis centers next to nephrology wings, infusion centers next to cancer centers, urgent care clinics next to emergency departments. And really, it's led us to dramatically expand the scope over and over again on top of an already overburdened hospital system. So you have a core, a hospital-centric system, and we're surrounding it with layer after layer after layer of additional services until we end up with a, 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 a turducken. It's a, it's a turkey <laughs> stuffed with chickens trying to duck the responsibilities. The, the metaphor kind of falls apart, but, but, but the, point is, the point is that from a managerial standpoint, the hospital represents a Frankensteinian um, a mashup of business models that is a one-size-fits-all delivery system, and it tries to do everything for everybody, but as a result, it struggles to do any of it particularly well. So what are the business models that work? What's disruptive out there? Well, 
I don't think it's any accident that I was paired up with, with these other speakers here tonight. Uh, the first one that I wanted to highlight is the retail clinic. And retail clinics are disruptive because uh, they, they utilize a completely different platform. But before I get into that, let's talk about why you would go to a retail clinic. We've all experienced that internal battle, that internal debate we have when we get sick. What, do I take a day off? Do I, you know, in order to see a doctor, there's that hemming and hawing that goes on. And a lot of us end up denying care to ourselves because the healthcare system is just so inconvenient and time consuming and costly that it's just not worth it. And I can't think of any better evidence that the healthcare business model is broken. So the retail clinic uses technology in order to enable nurses to staff its clinics rather than doctors. And there's no appointment necessary. You don't have to call in and hope that there's a same day appointment available so that you can see a doctor. They're not located around the hospital, they're located in your neighborhood pharmacy or grocery store. And rather than seeing everything under the sun, there's a menu posted out in front that says, we'll only see these 18 conditions, but anything else, you gotta go to the doctor. And so it is a very different business model than the one we're used to, and, and that makes it uh, disruptive because you're using a different venue and a different profession that is much lower cost. And the retail clinic uh, potentially can serve as this platform for new care, for new care and new patients to enter uh, the healthcare system who previously wouldn't be able to access care at all. Now, basically, the retail clinics are ideal because what we're doing is we're using technology in the right way, which is to encourage nurses to deliver more care. At the same time, as we heard earlier, we want to do the same thing and try to enable pharmacists to do more of that care and allow physician assistants to do more care and ultimately to allow patients to do more care. Cutting reimbursement rates to doctors and expecting them to somehow become more efficient is never going to be the right way to get to a more affordable system. Now, talking about empowering patients, and uh, you know, Jamie, Jamie's talk was, was fantastic, basically that is the ultimate disruption, to use tools and technologies to enable patients to take care of themselves more and more. And the word patient empowerment is really misleading because it kind of implies the need to give patients permission to take greater control of their health care. But uh, the truth is it's already happening, because especially for patients with chronic diseases, their doctors aren't around 24 hours a day, and so you have diabetics and dialysis patients and, and asthmatics who really know their diseases better than their doctors do. And they're talking to each other and they're, they're forming communities online and they're sharing information with, another, with one another, as we heard, and they're relying on each other as trusted sources of information before they even consider talking to a doctor. Now, I know this is threatening to a lot of doctors out there, but we have to realize that this is not a new idea. Weight Watchers and Alcoholics Anonymous, they've been around for decades, and we've happily accepted them as part of the mainstream of medical practice. The only thing that's dif different now is that with the internet, the patient doesn't have to hope that there's somebody in her neighborhood that shares her condition. She can connect with anybody around the world, even if she has a rare disease. And it is especially important for chronic disease management. Because, once again, as I said before, doctors can't be around 24 hours a day, and our healthcare system just doesn't have the capacity to deal with problems that are lifelong and behavior dependent because the system was built to manage acute episodic care. And for that kind of system, better chronic disease management and preventive care just means a visit every month instead of a visit every year. And that's not a solution that is affordable or effective. And instead, it's disrupting those older business models with new platforms of care that put patients at the controls that will ultimately allow us to manage chronic diseases more effectively. So I think back to uh, those days of reading micro hunters and thinking about how there were these invisible forces all around us that were so powerful, and I'm reminded of a, a common misconception about evolution. There is this misplaced belief that evolution represents a progression of inferior to superior beings, of simple to complex organisms. But once again, that's a misdiagnosis because it's based on only what we are able to observe with our naked eyes. We look around us and we see humans and other intelligent large animals dominating seemingly their environments, and so we assume that evolution must naturally favor animals like us. But that's the same type of reasoning that leads us to misdiagnose the problems of healthcare. As we know, once we start to dig deeper, we recognize that survival of the fittest doesn't mean you have to be big and complex. In fact, as biologists will tell you, those uh, characteristics are often liabilities. Nature favors simplicity. 
And uh, it's those organisms that don't waste their energy doing unnecessary functions that ultimately thrive. And likewise, in business and in healthcare, it's those simple, focused business models that have managed to carve out a piece of the workload from the hospital-centric system that will ultimately find success. Because we cannot reform the healthcare system by simply adding a few pieces here and there or cutting out a few pieces here and there through cost cuts. We can't force doctors to somehow become more cost effective by cutting reimbursement rates because instead of seeing patients every 15 minutes, they'll just start seeing patients every 10 minutes. We can't force insurers to start cutting their premiums because they're just going to try harder to deny claims and uh, increase their uh, co payments in order to reduce their losses. The healthcare system is a dinosaur that sees the meteor coming, but no matter how hard it tries, it can't mutate into something that's not still a dinosaur. Instead, it's going to be the other creatures that find themselves best adapted to a changing environment. Uh, it's those that have managed to shed unnecessary overhead that will succeed. Whether it's, whether it's uh, business or whether it's uh, uh, health care, Einstein said it best, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. There are a lot of us in healthcare who like to believe that the healthcare system and our industry is unique. And in many ways it is, but there's one important way, one important thing about it that's not unique, and that is this challenge of producing better quality for a lower cost. Every industry faces that exact same challenge. The only difference is that we have somehow hoped that our existing institutions and our existing business models will miraculously become cheaper or more efficient in order to lower costs. And that's just not going to happen. Instead, it's going to require us to disrupt those older business models with new platforms that uh, use technology to enable uh, new providers to deliver care in entirely new venues. So using technology to empower a generalist physician to start acting like a low-level specialist so she doesn't have to refer all her patients out to the costly expert. Or using technology to enable a pharmacist or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant to answer more of the questions that their patients have rather than having to funnel everything through a doctor and ultimately empowering patients so that they can do more for themselves than they ever could before. Well, that's how you use technology to drive costs down rather than up. And that's what I mean by disruptive innovation in healthcare. That's really how we're going to bend the cost curve. And that's, I think, the diagnosis that we all need to be focused on. Thank you.